Hi folks, welcome to Monday's edition of the iWrite Radio Podcast Stroke Videocast. I need to look at my notes here because we've got a lot to cover today. Um, Kate Forbes was at the presser. She's brought out a paper that she sent down to the government on the way out, the way to save the economy after coronavirus. Dominic Cummings has been out with his chopping axe, cutting the civil service into the shape he wants. Uh, Mr. Trump's been tweeting again. Israel's about to take over the world. And our own Ruth Wisher seems to have picked a side on the issue of another independence party. Start with the presser, boys. What did we think? Stuart? Um, <clears throat> it was shorter than usual. I don't think we expected too much. We got what we were expecting in the, in the, controversi- in the area of contra- controversial, uh, which was the question of the, any difference between Scotland and England uh, to do with possible quarantine, air bridges, people flying into the UK. Um, there's, there's not too much on that, but the, the important thing was, as you said, uh, the, she had Kate Forbes, the fiscal secretary, is that right? Financial secretary. Chancellor. <laughs> Chancellor uh, of the Scottish Government with her today, and uh, as you say, she put out this uh, um, report. I'll let you cover that, Nori. Um, one or two things that she made very clear, the First Minister, she's getting a bit fed up with uh, being ignored by London. Um, she said um, she was going to take a public health, hard-headed approach to issues that might come up. And they're talking about possible quarantine. And nobody actually asked her if he was going to close the border. So she wasn't allowed to make a, a statement on that. Well, I don't think she wanted to. But she stressed two or three times that she will go down. She has her a legal duty for the public health of the people of Scotland, and she will enforce it regardless of what comes out of um, London. What other things she said? I think while we're still on that subject, I think one of the most important things that needs to be stressed here is there was no discussion with the devolved administrations about this air bridge policy. So it was Westminster not asking how to affect them. Yeah, no, she was really annoyed about that, which is why she kind of she kind of caught, brought it up either vague, vaguely or directly two or three times. She said one or two other things. That's all she said. She, she said, um, if the virus spreads, we go back. And uh, she said she was quite worried, looking around at the rest of the world, the rest of the UK, that it's still it, it's a possibility that we might have to go back. Jimmy? Yeah, I, I thought it was a a pretty good performance. I was quite impressed with Kate Forbes. Um, always handy when you have somebody with her um, technical background, shall we say, in the financial side of things. But I, I, I do worry that in the past, a, a, a document like that sent to London would be roundly ignored. There'd be a bit of derision for the press and London would just ignore it. But I think it, there are some serious um, interesting proposals in there. And I do hope that it isn't just dismissed out of hand because it comes from the SNP. I'm pretty sure it will be. What I find quite strange about this is this is a great opportunity to do a little bit of experimentation. If you give the devolved administrations, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, the opportunity to go their own way. It can tell you a lot, if you're the Westminster government, about how you treat different areas of England. You know, I mean, London's a standalone, but when you get down to Cornwall or the no- up to the northeast and west, who look a lot more like the devolved administrations look. Exactly. It could be really useful information for our Westminster government. And yeah. if they were to look at it that way, I mean, there would be hell to pay if it went wrong because there would be accusations of the kind that were thrown about for the poll tax when Scotland was used as an experiment for the poll tax. But it could be very useful to see what works. I think you've been optimistic there, Nori. Oh, I, 
I no, think I'm being optimistic as well, Stuart. Yeah. I'm just pointing out that... Yeah, but look, think about the government we've got. Dominic Cummings, you just mentioned chopping away at the civil service. We have a government that is grabbing powers back, not devolving them. <coughs> well, well, I, I think, the, I think that's they without specifically, But spe they specifically said in their manifesto for the election they just won that they would be devolving powers to the... Regions. I think I think <laughs> the difference the difference is it's a bit like the Scottish Tories who want powers devolved, they just don't want them devolved to Holyrood. They want them devolved to councils. Yeah. Because they well, control some councils and you know they can choose to spend the money on ice cream instead of hospitals. Ah, it's, it's interesting, as you see, the the whole um Dominic Cummings setting up government and his own image kind of thing belies their manifesto. But you do have voices that in England that they will have to listen to. I mean, they, you look at an Andy Burnham, for example, as well as Manchester being a huge financial powerhouse for the English economy in terms of what comes out of that region. That's Andy Burnham has control of the Greater Manchester Police. Should there ever be any issues um, of public order in England, Andy Burnham has to be on site because the GMP riot boys are the best in the business. That's the boot boys that they would send up here if we caused them bother. That's the boot boys that they take down to London if the Met can't handle it. So I kind of got to keep him on site. I mean, that, I think, also loops back to the question about policing the borders. Um, border force is completely under the control of the Home Office. Mm -hmm. So even the, the Police Scotland is technically under the Home Office, although, you know... Yeah, the Scottish really Police really... Authority would have something to say about the Home Office interfering in any operations of the Scottish, of the Police Scotland these days. Mm -hmm. Well, let, if they, look, if the, if the Border Force let people off a plane into, through Edinburgh Airport onto the, you know, opposite of your side, passenger side, um, into the country. At that point, public health is the responsibility of the Scottish government and they can t take over. Aye, we can't, we can't have our own quarantine, for example, if we choose to. Yeah, yes. yeah, I understand that, but wouldn't it be a lot easier not to let the planes land? <laughs> Aye. But then, there is sure. another issue, of course, an awful lot of people from Scotland who go on their holidays go to Manchester and, and quite a lot in fact go to Newcastle as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, it, it will be interesting um, if it comes about. I can't, I don't think it'll ever get to that. I don't think it'll ever be heavily policed, put it that way. She might well introduce a quarantine, but I think it'll be up to the individual. I mean, the quarantine in England is a case of you leave a phone number, they come around and knock mm. on the door of one in every thousand or whatever it is to check you're in. I think if the numbers are still as piss poor in England in a couple of weeks, she'll introduce a quarantine when, they, when their school holidays kick in. But I think it'll be mainly as a threat, in other words, to deter people from charging up to Scotland. If you're going to go on holiday, fine, go to France. Well, I've, well, I've heard I've heard a report this morning that the Highlands are filling up already. The A9 was chocker this morning. People move coming up. Well, it's an interesting point, mate, because most of the places can't open till Friday. And all, all the cottages and B and uh, sorry B and Bs and the self-contained flats and all that. None of them are allowed to open till Friday. So yeah, well, if, the, if the Highlands are rammed already, it's probably Scottish people that are doing it. Mm, and that, and I suppose the results of that are a couple of weeks away. Mm. So we, we we need to keep an eye on that, guys. We mentioned Dominic Cummings earlier on, um, and it looks like all the things he blogged about, about basically clearing out the civil service and putting in political placemen, it looks, about, looks like that's about to start. Now, there are some countries in the world where, depending on what government gets in, Malta, I do know a bit about, and in Malta, basically, it's all placemen. So if a government changes, the civil service changes. Hmm. 
same yeah, I mean, America, the White House. In America, aye, they famously, I think there's 5,000 policemen jobs go when a government changes in America. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's where, but that's, they say that's where, where Jimmy Carter went wrong. He went up there, took in 5,000 new people instead of rehiring all the 5,000 that expected to get a, their jobs back with a new president. And the, they were all the Washington elite and they turned against Jimmy Carter. So we never got another chance. You never got another chance because Iran took the fucking embassy of the Americans, mate. Yeah, well, to be honest, that. if the Iranians had, if the Iranians didn't hold the embassy, Ronald yeah. Reagan wouldn't have won that election. Yeah. No, so, true. well, from our point of view, from a British point of view, how serious is this? What do you mean to the Constitution or to the, well, health, the health of the nation? Well, to the democracy of the nation. Well, the democracy. Well, it's. I think it's more. I think I'm ahead of the curve on that one. I take it more seriously than most people I talk to. I, well, I, um, I find it very frightening. Um, I, I also can't help but feel that if it's okay for Westminster, will it be okay for Holyrood? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. If we remove the placemen that the British government puts into our government, there would be uproar. If we removed Leslie Evans and appointed internally rather than letting Whitehall give us a list of candidates from which to choose, there would be a major constitutional problem. Well, there's your next constitutional the problem, Jimmy, though. Will Dominic Cummings start sending up his Brexiteer uh, free marketeers? I don't think he cares a one fig about Scotland, mate, as long as we don't go independent and cut the purse strings. As long as they can still have the revenue that they take out of Scotland every year, they're happy. And they ensure that by not allowing us to have a referendum. There is a possibility, given these backers are the basically American, the Koch brothers and Tufton Street and all that whole story, but there's also a lot of Russian money involved. You know, the Russians are quite happy to see chaos in Britain. So who knows what side he'd go on that. Well, I, I mean... I I'm thinking about the size of the Scottish office building in New Street. I'm also thinking about how this would tie into an American trade deal when it comes to our NHS. If our civil service is basically a Westminster civil service, how far can they enact Westminster policy by being obstructive to our Scottish government's policy? Could this, in fact, undermine our progressive stance in Scotland? Pretty well. I mean, let's be honest, they do it at a council level. They do it for Labour through COSLA. At the end of the day, COSLA is a unionist organisation, so I'd be surprised if the Tories make it difficult at a national level. The Labour are making it difficult at a council level. Why would be surprised if the Tories do it at a national level? And I think that's why they built their um, new Scottish government and sort of UK government in Scotland's office. Although people got awfully exercised about that and talked about thousands of new civil service jobs and it really wasn't a mess of them a transfer for other offices. But I, I expect that the, I expect that Leslie Evans, when she come, when she loses her job, will be replaced by someone that Dominic Cummings has handpicked, for example. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's my worry is much more pointed at Scotland because I don't think the civil service in London that interacts directly with the government is anything but a Tory entity anyway. Mate, yeah. they're all pub that's the reality of this, the, this famed British civil service and how it's um, totally unbiased and works for the good of the country at all times. It's hardly that. Most of the mandarins are public school boys. They've all been dragged up in the very much the, the British middle class or middle to upper class way. And they, their idea of working for the country is to work for the Conservative Party. So well, look, what happened, much ha look what happened when Harold Wilson was in power. There's very strong evidence that the intelligence services threatened to threaten the coup d'etat. Uh, if you believe, believe Peter Wright, mate, um, 
not just threatened a coup d'etat, but made sure that they did need to have a coup d'etat by absolutely eviscerating the Labour Party from the inside. Well, um, I think to keep an eye on the sort of the, the next area I think maybe we should mention is the Israeli proposed takeover of 30% of Palestinian land. Now, this is part of people have kind of seem to have forgotten this is part of the deal the peace deal that Trump proposed that he referred to as a win-win, a win for Israel and a win for Palestine. A peace deal that doesn't exist, a peace deal that only exists in Donald's mind. Well, and the Israelis yeah. agreed to it because it gave them 30% of Palestinian exactly. land. I think it's worth pointing out that uh, Tommy Robinson has just announced that he's, to he's a Zionist and totally in favour of the... Um, expropriation of uh, Palestinian land. So, you know, that places a, a big flag straight in mm. there. What side do you want to be on? Uh, How do you it, even know that, Stuart? Because it was on social media this morning. I, anything that's got Tommy Robertson in it, I just ignore. I usually have the same, if I'm honest. Uh, although I'd love to bump into him in a quiet corner of Leith or that, but I'm pretty sure he never shows his face in Scotland. And if he does, I've kind of know that it'd be some wee shithole like Lark Hall or Wisho that he'd turn up in. Aye, probably, probably. So um, I take it we are none of us in favour of the Israeli government, the Israeli state taking over. No, I, I am not a Zionist. I've never been a Zionist. I've got plenty of Jewish friends who are not Zionists. It's a very bad idea, what's happening in Israel. It's got no, no easy end. Well... As I say, it's not a peace deal. It's, been it's not even imposed. It's just happening. Donald Trump calls it a peace deal, but it's just a policy. You know, the, what, the we're see, what, we're, what we're seeing here is Israel and America both telling the world that they are in favour of a two-state solution whilst absolutely guaranteed that there cannot be two states in that piece of land. You know, look at, uh, think about it. If the balance of power in the Middle East changes, which you, we've seen it changing at the moment with Turkey being very belligerent, there's a, the threat, there is a war in Libya, it's Turkey versus Egypt. You've got the Saudis who are particularly aggressive in Yemen. Uh, and how long will uh, Israel stand there on its own without a whole new? Well, it would be interesting to speculate if. Iran and Iraq weren't in such a state, or if Iran and Iraq, Syria, ever well, managed to get together. That's a me. Why do you know Soleimani? That was a specific reason. There was a corridor from Baghdad through Tehran to Lebanon. Yeah. They were all going to work together. They were all going to work together, including Syria, to ensure that Israel did not expand. That's why the Americans took out the leader. The, the worry we have, though, is none, none, since that happened, none of our press have even gone and taken a look at that picture again. That's you a... think for a second that, that taking out that leader is going to be left to stand? Because I've never known the Iranians to accept any imposition from America. It might have taken them 30 years, but they tossed the fucking shout. There's no danger they're going to let this stand. And frankly, that's where the next war comes because if, they, if the Iranians rolled tanks through Iraq, through Syria, and put them on the Lebanese border with Israel, what do the Israelis do? They've got to try and attack. Well, the UN has come out against it officially. So will we get a, what's the section number again? The one that we thought we had to go and invade? Right. Uh, no. Other Middle Eastern country. Just we just you watch America and the United Kingdom brushing off the dust off their vetoes for anything that happens in the UN. Oh yeah, well, oh yeah. But, but just let's get here's a thought before we move on. Think of the size of the army: Turkey, eighty million people; Iran, eighty million people. And these are both fully armed countries. Egypt, the biggest Arab country. It's a hundred million people, it's got a big arm. All these countries have got huge armed forces. And mm. Donald Trump is pulling American troops out of the Middle East and pulling financial support, which equates to influence out of the Middle East. 
So if he gets a second term, how happy is Israel going to be about that? Be interesting to see if we can catch the Israelis interfering in the American election. <laughs> what do you so mean if we can catch? Well, they're pretty. I'm pretty certain they've done. They've been doing it for years, mate. But it'd be oh, interesting to see if they get caught. The Israeli lobby in America is at every level and mm. incredibly well funded. And in and in this country, by the way. Well, you've got to bear, bear in mind that anti Corbyn stuff. Even before the uh, the Berlin Wall came down, before the end of the Soviet Union, millions of Russians were escaping to Israel by claiming Jewish heritage. And there's a, a third of the population of Israel is now, of the Jewish population of Israel, is now Russian heritage. People don't seem to realize this. Do you think Vlad's got a, a whole bunch of sleepers in there ready to stir up trouble? I, I don't think they're sleepers at all. I think they're, 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 they're totally blatant. That's one of the things they do. They take, well, look what happened to Abramovich. When he got uh, refused to, to his uh, visa to be renewed in London, uh, he switched his identity to Israel, didn't he? Straight away, boom. Okay, Israel done to death. I think we need to stay on Trump, though. Jimmy, you spotted uh, Ur Donald's been tweeting again. Aye, he's been a bigger twatter on Twitter than the world's ever seen before, which takes some doing. He um, retweeted the video, I think, yesterday, and then took it down a couple of hours later once his however many million followers had had a wee party watching it. And fair play to Donald, I didn't think he could out racism himself, but he did. It's the most disgusting bit of racist nonsense that he's tweeted either while he was president or beforehand. I didn't and see it, so you're going to have to tell me what it can It's take. a bunch of rednecks on golf carts. Shout with the fists up shouting, white power, white power, white power. And Donald apparently said that he didn't hear the phrase white power. I don't know how far his head would have to be up his ass for him not to hear it. But seriously, it's the first thing you hear on the video. And it's consistently running through that video. The man's a disgrace. That The guy that was on Mar on Sunday, he's the only black cabinet member of Trump's um, government. Uh, was basically saying, you don't listen to what Donald says. You look at what he does. <laughs> he, he opened a couple of help help the black Amer, um, American blacks get jobs things. Ah, this was the this was the black health secretary or something. Yeah, he's he's well, I'm not sure if he was a health secretary, but he's he's a surgeon. Yeah, That's his he's profession. Also, he's also a member of the of uh, Donald Trump's government. Yeah, he's in the cabinet. He's go. the only black guy in the cabinet. You sure he's the only one left? There were quite a few when he took over. Uh, he's the only one, apparently, that sits around the cabinet table. He was very good, I have to say. I was really impressed. His, his answers were very succinct, and he did answer the questions. Um, he, won he didn't look evasive or sound evasive at all. Yeah, but, but he'd, it, he'd had a run for president as well, I think. Did he? But, I mean, there yeah. was the, of course, the, thing, the things he said, I don't think you or me or Jimmy would, could uh, argue against because we didn't know if they were true or not. They were specific to uh, America. I'm fairly confident his point about Trump not being a racist, I would argue with. <laughs> I'm pretty confident about that. I shouldn't laugh. I know it's not funny. Come on, you're raised, if you're raised by a Klansman, you're kind of going to have skewed views. And, um, Donald's father was absolutely 100% a Klansman. So, oh, well. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree with the Klan. Aye. It's just a shame that this particular one's been left on the ground rotten. Mm. Uh, the final thing we, we thought we would discuss is Ruth Wishart's piece in the National um, about a second independence party standing on the list next year at Holyrood. Jimmy, you yeah. have a pop at this one. Well, I've got a lot of time for Ruth Wisher. I think she's quite a good writer, quite a good judge of people and policy. On this one, I think she's made a huge misstep. Um, she seems to have come to the conclusion that list parties are a fabulous idea it's all upside, there's no downside. 
So she wrote this lovely um, one-sided piece. And normally her pieces kind of aren't. They're usually balanced. But um, I, I have issues with it, mate, because as I say, trying to engage with the people behind these list parties, you get no answers. They don't want to face scrutiny. I see considerable downsides, and I want to discuss the downside, and nobody will do it. And I'm kind of a bit annoyed at Ruth because she's got a quite a loud voice and a large platform. And mm -hmm. I worry that she was being deliberately opaque and obtuse and not seeing any of those downsides and playing up the positives. Because I think people with that big platform, this needs discussion. It needs mm -hmm. serious discussion. And I think the, plat the platformed people should maybe wait and let the Yes Movement have a good go at working out what we think before they start telling us how we should think. I'm with Peter, I'm with Peter yeah. Bell on this, that um, all you really need is a majority at the, at the next Holyrood Parliament. You don't need a bigger majority. It's not going to make any difference. And what's really needed is the change of policy of the SNP. Mm -hmm. And that, I, doesn't, I mean, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't change with a list. I, I didn't see change it. change with a list uh, vote. I, Peter's, Peter's clear on that, Stuart. Hey, the, 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 these um, list parties are saying they're going to pressure the SNP. How? If you're adding to their... Um, pro any numbers. Numbers. Ah, you didn't put any pressure. I, I, as I say, I have some serious concerns about this, and I do see downsides. And none... Uh, so far, there's, you've got the Alliance for Yes and the Independence for Scotland Party, and none of them will engage on any of the negatives. And, I mean, Peter Bell this morning came out with... I, I, he did coin the phrase, and I do quite like it, rise in disguise. Uh -huh. It basically rolls off the tongue, and it certainly applies to a few of these people that are in the alliance for yes. But, um, I do, I mean, my, my issue with it is it, the maths of it bother me. Hmm. You know, um, it doesn't really matter if they sort of pull the number of votes that rise would pull. However, it really does matter if they do better than that. Um, I, I need to know where they're going to stand. I need to see a manifesto. I need to know why I would give my second vote to a party that stands for the same thing as the party I gave my first vote to. Right. Well, um, you see, I, I have problems with this whole idea of gaming the system. I mean, why is it that we, for 20 years, have embrace the fact that Scotland has a far more proportional parliament than we see in the UK. But, every, we... but Jimmy, everybody games the system. The Liberal Democrats pour money into Alex Cole's constituency. You know, I mean, but not every party game games the system. The system. To silence voices. We are trying to silence well, the, the voices of the, the Greens. The Greens do it. The Greens only stand in certain constituencies. I think with more, more, more to the point, no. can we, can we, I think Peter Bell's right about this. Is it going to achieve what the people claim they want? That's they, the big question. And I don't think it is. If, if you had a system like the American system where you had primaries or something, where all the pro indie parties had to fight it out first before the election to see who, which party got to go to stand in the, the last election, then you might have an argument. Because there'd only be one part, one alternative party to the SNP. But the, the way it is at the moment, who, who would you vote for? It would just mess it up. I'm pretty sure that, I mean, if they don't amalgamate, they're dead anyway. You can't have two. You, uh, one less well, party, possibly. There's going to be more than two, mate. That's for sure. Come on, it's the left. You can't yeah, love to yeah. be a in a sack. Yeah. But the other issue here is the issue that Jimmy mentioned, leverage. Anything that makes the SNP commit wholeheartedly to a referendum next year is a good thing. I question whether they'll have enough leverage to actually influence that. But exactly. if it gets the SNP talking hierarchy, let's put it that way, of the SNP talking and thinking about how they're going to make it happen, it's a good thing. Nori, you, Nori, you said earlier everybody games the system. I still, my point still stands. Why do we think it's democratic to silence the voices of opposition? Why do we think that independence parties deserve to get 80% of the seats in the parliament or 55% of the vote? 
Well, I'm... That's, that's not just gaming the system, mate. That's cheating. It's, I it's worry sound. That, I worry that Westminster it, will turn it, around and set aside. If they see it as cheating and they lose loads of seats, but you're, what's wrong with Westminster turn around and saying, okay, what? that's an illegitimate election, we'll just shut your parliament. Your point is that we should be less sneaky than everybody else. The system exists at Holyrood because it looked like the system that would keep the SNP out. No, 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 no. Failed no, 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 in doing no. that. That's, that's a misnomer. That's a lie that people have people say and come out with all the time. The system wasn't set up to stop an SNP majority because the SNP got a majority in 2011. No, the system, so the system was, clearly wasn't set up. To the stop fact an they SNP got it wrong, majority. Jimmy, does not alter the fact that their belief was that there would always be a combination of Liberal Democrat and or Tory Aye. Labour votes to keep the SNP out. But we, That's we happily why asked up. for PR. We asked for PR in 1999. The SNP wanted a proportionate system. They didn't want the height. So you're saying that the Haunt is specifically set up just to avoid the system was single I mean, the, party the, government. The people that made the t decision have admitted that one of no, the no. they took it. I'm sorry, they did. Well, look at the definition. Look, by definition, the system they set up failed in whatever plan they had in mind. Yeah, and I'm not disagreeing yeah. with that either. I didn't say they were right. And, what and I'm again, saying is they tried to play the electoral system to suit their agenda. You know, I mean, it's the same reason you won't be seeing proportional uh, representation at Westminster. Because the system that winner takes all suits the people in the power to make that decision. Nobody in their right mind can argue that proportional representation isn't fairer than first past the post. So why are we trying to engineer an unproportional result through a proportional well, system? My, my argument is... If you're going to play with the big boys, why don't you play by their rules? Why do we have to be more honest, more democratic? Because over a million Scots vote for the Tories, Labour and Liberal parties, and they deserve to be represented just as much as we do. And only 25% of the British public voted for the Tories and they're in power at Westminster. Look, there'll be, there'll be more point I'm having two Labour parties standing at this next Hollywood election, one pro indie and one against indie. That would make a mix. That would sound fair from what I gather. Well, yeah. yeah. Again, you come up against the the policy argument if you you don't can't have two parties with the same policies. Effectively, that's that's and what the electoral commission says. Aye, and you think that um, these indie party clowns that say, we're going to support the SNP on everything. We only, that's their policy, mate. We're going to support the SNP well, on everything, I mean, but we want to push I would, them. I would vote SNP then. And if, all we have at the moment is the assertion from the people behind these parties that the Electoral Commission has said that what they're doing is legal. We oh. don't have anything from the Electoral Commission to confirm that. To get my vote, Jimmy, they've got a long way to go. I mean... The, you know, they will they will have to earn my vote. Um, hmm. I would at the moment I'm ninety eight point seven six percent sure of giving both my votes to the SNP. However, if one of them produces a manifesto that aligns exactly with what I want, they might get my vote. And is it not democratic to have as much choice as possible? It's pointless anyway. Is it going to get, get us any closer to independence? That's the other big question. I mean, will it affect anything? Mm. If the SNP are still in government, it's really not going to matter if you've got half a dozen pro indie MSPs from the list um, because the SNP will be able to make all the decisions without any help from anybody. It doesn't uh, really bother me if there's a scrap amongst the left just now they, they, they might as well carry on it's still months and it's nearly a year before the, the election anyway ah uh, Stuart it's not a scrap amongst the left is it that's not how it's going to be um, reported it's going to be mm. a scrap between the SNP and other members of the Yes movement the 
best outcome. That's going to be all over every paper. The SNP is falling out with supporters. The best outcome I can see from this is that it generates a discussion about the fabled Plan B. Aye. That's the best outcome, and I don't. If it forces that argument discussion, it may be a good thing. But yeah, Jimmy's sure. right. I mean, it will be another civil war in the SNP headline generator. That, but that's that's what the whole thing's about, mate. It's just, that right now, it looks like the SNP are going to win some at like sixty odd constituency seats, given how they're sitting in the polls. So it looks like they're going to have a majority anyway, just from the constituencies. The worry is that if we can have eight months of a media campaign telling us that the SNP are falling out amongst themselves and that pushes the numbers down, they end up only getting 60 seats and they end up only getting three list seats and we have a, a, a unionist majority in the parliament. Look, if we're, going to, if we're going to game the system and, and the press. Look, guys, if we're going to game the system, if the part of the system that needs gamed is the media, not the voting system. You kind of game the media, sure. It's fucking owned by billionaires. Yeah, you've got to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, but J.K. Rowland's not going to hand me cash to go and buy the Daily Record. She doesn't like me that much. I think, I, I, I do think that there's, I think you lose your argument about it being undemocratic because it, the more parties that stand, the better if, and I, this is the big if for me, if you're looking at different manifestos, it gives more people a choice. There's not going to be different manifestos. Well, I mean, effectively, how, effectively, how the unionists will present this is that the SNP have cheated. They've set up these parties to get so that they could get more SNP MSPs into Holyrood. And as I say... Well, what Jimmy, to, Jimmy, that's great. And what Nicholas should do is turn around and say, okay, we'll go to the Westminster system of first past the post. How hmm. do you like them eggs? No, they because be every seat bar one or two in the borders. They can't change. Hmm. They can't. That, it's not within the competence of the... Well, can, to can you imagine the howls of anguish from the unionists? Yeah, but it can't happen. It's not within the competence no, of but the I'm All I'm doing is suggesting that that's the retort. If you don't like it, we'll go to first past the post. How do you like them eggs? Well, how do you like the eggs? Of Westminster turning around and say this is an illegitimate, legit. Uh, this is an illegitimate result to the Scottish election. Therefore, we are going to set aside this result and we are going to close Holyrood. Very difficult for them to argue that when they're when they've got a first past the post system. They didn't. didn't their system no. doesn't matter, mate. They're still. They're still our yep, lords. Yep, yep. They can still do whatever they choose to. That's well, true. Including they, they, closing they, our they, parliament and rescinding the Scotland Act. I think you're both forgetting that uh, down south they just compare uh, Holyrood as a county council. Mm -hmm. so well, an, they, an English county council. The bad politicians amongst them do. And long may they continue to do exactly that. Talking of bad politicians, can we just end it with Nicola having a laugh at Michael Gove? I don't know if you've seen it yet, guys, but go on Twitter and have a look at that. Michael Gove put out some horse shite about um, legitimacy, and uh, democratic legitimacy oh, in right. the Aye. US Constitution back in the 1700s, at which point Nicola basically ripped him a new one. What was it he said? It's he said just hook, folks. Had we been able to speak to Andrew Jackson, et cetera, mm. et cetera, uh, we would have been making the argument that they couldn't survive as an independent nation. And, Nic and Nicola said, why did he have to go back so far into history to find an example? You can tell how much she enjoyed it because she ended her tweet with a couple of wee winky emojis. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, somebody came up with an absolute belter underneath it. And I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it's, an, it's a pearl on me. Just um, when we look at Michael Gove and how slimy he is and what have you, somebody was talking about he does, he does nothing without the support of Lady Mick Gove. And I thought that was a beautiful way to Sarah, label that Mrs. of his. Sarah yeah, Vine. Right. She write Lady for, Mick Gove, I like that. She write for the... Yeah, she's with the, the Daily Mail, isn't she? Is she a mail writer? I thought she was telling her, but it doesn't matter. 
I've no, noticed a few changes she, she, under the new editor of the mail, actually. Uh, uh, but she's, no, she's, there, uh, she's, in the mud, she's with the Murdoch paper, that's for sure. Uh, she's, uh, well, Gil Most goes back to being Murdoch's choice for bloody yeah. Prime Minister again if Boris makes a pig's lug of things, isn't he? A bigger pig's lug. Ah, a true, pig's uh, lugs. A herd of pig's lugs. Mate, did you see him with his hard hat on at the school in the news at lunchtime? No, I missed that. Bloody brilliant. Talk about me having a big mallet. His hard hat's about three sizes too wee. All that fucking mop hanging. He looks like Wurzel Gummidge. He looks like John <laughs> Ferby when he played Wurzel Gummidge back in the day. And with that picture in our heads, I think we'll call it a day, folks. Uh, thank you, Jimmy Hutton, Stuart Lockhead. I'm Norrie Stewart. Thanks for listening go. to the I Write Radio podcast. And we'll catch up with you tomorrow when no doubt Mr. Trump will have decided that he loves black people. Cheers for now.